Hello there. I hope we're all live on all the different platforms. Um, my name is Helena. Um, I want to say well, hello to everyone uh, and thank you for joining us on this live stream of Breaking It Down uh, Multiple Sclerosis. This is the MS Trust podcast. And today we're going to be talking about MS, your emotions and feelings. Uh, and like I said, I'm Helena, and with me off screen is Nick. Um, he's uh, looking after all the comments and, and things today. Um, we both work at the Common Educations team here at the MS Trust, uh, which is a charity to help people make sense of MS in the UK. And today we are going to go live across several different channels today. So I'm going to say hello to YouTube, Facebook, Twitch and Twitter. Obviously, you can't see us. <laughs> I would say now I'm getting everything wrong already. Obviously, <laughs> we can't see you guys. You're probably eating lunch, and I'm very jealous of you. <laughs> That's why I'm getting things muddled up. Um, but we can't see you, so. Uh, but hopefully, you can see us. Um, during the stream today, we're going to be speaking to two experts on why MS can impact so heavily on your emotions and how you feel day to day. And uh, they'll hopefully be giving us some tips on how we can deal with these feelings and improve overall uh, well-being. Um, so joining us live for this session today, uh, I'm going to see if we can get them on the screen to have a little wave, uh, is uh, Roshan Dasner, uh, who is a professor of clinical psychology and senior research scientist at Sintef in Norway, and a professor of clinical psychology and neuropsychology at the University of Nottingham in the UK, uh, coming in from, from uh, Trondheim, I think, in Norway. <laughs> Very exciting. And also, we got Dr. Cora Sargent, who is an educational psychologist and a person living with MS. Uh, so we're going to chat to each guest individually, and then we're going to open the floor for questions from you guys who are turning, tuning in. And you can pop questions in the chat uh, on the various uh, channels that you're watching. And Nick will try and pick up as many as we can answer um, after we've chatted to them. And now first, uh, for every, anyone who isn't familiar with the work of the MS Trust, we're here for everyone affected by MS from the moment of diagnosis and onwards. And we work towards making sure that people living with the condition can access good quality, specialist care and live the best life possible. Uh, and we do this in a different of <laughs> we do this uh, a number of different ways uh, by placing and training MS health uh, professionals across the UK, including specialist nurses and advanced MS champions. Uh, we also produce practical evidence-based information, both online and in print. You might be able to see some behind me here that can be all sent uh, after for free if you're in the UK. Uh, if you're not in the UK and you're watching this, you can still access it uh, online from our website. Uh, and finally, we have a friendly and knowledgeable inquiry service team that's available for anyone who wants to know more about MS. I'll tell you a little bit more about them at the end of the session. So we're basically here to help make sense of MS. Um, and as we mentioned at the start, we're a charity uh, and we receive no funding from the government or the NHS. It's uh, wholly due to the generosity of people like yourself who are watching uh, and many of our fundraisers and people who support the MS Trust that we can sort of continue on our mission. And if you would like to donate towards the work that we do, uh, the link is mstrust.org.uk forward slash donate. Now, in this stream, we're going to be looking at emotions and feelings. Uh, we recently did a survey of over 2,000 people living with MS in the UK, and it revealed that 56% feel that MS negatively impacts on their mental health. And the survey also revealed that the burden of living with certain symptoms is a driving factor behind declining emotional well-being. And in particular, the survey showed us that you find that fatigue, walking difficulties and bladder and bowel problems have the biggest impact on your mental health. With this in mind, uh, during MS Awareness Week, the MS Trust will provide, be providing a number of resources that focus directly on the impact of these symptoms that have, have on your mental well-being. And I hope we're going to be offering some tips and techniques to manage them. And this live stream being one of them. And also this MS Awareness Week, we're working together with the MS Society, MS UK, Shift.MS, Overcoming MS, MS Together, MS National Therapy Centers to shine a brighter light on MS than ever before. Uh, you might have been able to see on social media our campaign, that's uh, the hashtag MS Makes Me. Uh, you should search for that hashtag and join the conversation. 
So in fact, before we hear from our first speaker, Roshan, uh, we're just going to start by playing a short video on some of the emotions you told us MS makes you feel. MS makes me scared. I'm newly diagnosed, so I've got a lot to think about. I'm not going to pretend that isn't bothering me because it is, but I am committing to myself that I'm not going to let this rule my life and I'm going to try and get on the best way I can. MS can sometimes make me feel isolated and I think that's because there's been times in the past where I've made plans and I've had to cancel because of a bad flare-up or because of a relapse. Um, I think sometimes when I'm explaining how I'm feeling, it might feel a little exaggerated or a little dramatic. And I think it just makes me feel a little bit isolated and not quite like people that don't have MS. MS makes me frustrated. It makes me frustrated because most of the time it's an invisible illness and people will assume that because they can't see anything wrong that there mustn't be anything wrong and that's definitely not the case. It also makes me frustrated because I've had to accept the fact that I can't and won't be able to do everything that my friends and people my age can do and I can't plan ahead like my friends can because MS is predictably unpredictable. <laughs> Yes, MS is predictably unpredictable. I like that. I think that's very, very, very true. Right. So let's kick off the discussion then. And first, uh, I'm going to bring on my first guest, uh, Roshan, who I've already introduced. is a professor of clinical psychology and neuropsychology psychology. And Roshan's been on our podcast and webinars before when we were talking about cognition and MS. I'm very happy to, to have you back uh, again, Roshan. Uh, welcome. I hope you're well. Thank you so much for coming on the live stream. Oh, thanks very much, Helena. Thanks for inviting me again. All right. So should we kick off and just sort of discuss a little bit how can MS affect your feelings and your mental health? Hmm. Well, many people with MS uh, will experience some difficulties with their mood problems, particularly during the diagnosis period and during different parts of their MS journey, for example, during relapses or uh, when new symptoms emerge. And you know what? even in just general daily life. But the key thing to remember here is that not everyone with MS does have or will go on to develop mental health difficulties. And your survey has also shown this up where you know a significant number of people do experience these difficulties. It's not ubiquitous, it's not everybody who has these difficulties. The second thing to mention, I suppose, is that everyone with MS will have their own unique ways or experiences of MS and um, the psychological challenges that, um, that, that are linked to this experience of MS. So while people without MS or those with other chronic health conditions also have mental health difficulties, some unique features of MS make people with MS more vulnerable. For example, as you know, some people in the videos you just showed us said, the unpredictability aspects of MS can make it very difficult for people to manage their, their emotions. So for example, in one study that we did where we looked at unpredictability and how it affected people with MS, we found that it affected people's thinking, how they felt, and ultimately also affected their behavior. So what I mean by this is, you know, people had a perceived loss of control. Uh, if they felt that they lost their independence, their self-confidence, and ultimately, uh, you know, a, a sense of purpose. And, and, and that made them feel distressed, obviously, fear, anxiety, but also frustration and anxiety. And again, just like what people in the video said, but ultimately what this meant was that this affected their behaviors. And typically what we found was people began to isolate themselves a little bit more. They were a bit more withdrawn. So these ways of thinking, feeling and acting come up during, as I said, the diagnosis process, during the relapses, but also during remission. Hmm. And 
obviously you already kind of answered some of my, uh, my my next question here about how common is it because mm. our with sort of, sort of around half of people in 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 this survey but uh, has there been any sort of more measurement on 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 how common it is yeah there have been various studies that have looked at um the uh, the prevalence or the instance of um, having mood difficulties associated with MS. And to be to be honest, they've come up with different numbers. And that's pr predominantly because it depends on the way in which you, you measure uh, mood problems. It also depends on the way in which you sample people with, with MS. Um, but typically what we find is that uh, it's quite spread. So we have people with mild problems and these can be fluctuating, for example, but we can also experience people with more, we also see people with more severe problems and people may experience these as being persistent. In terms of depression, uh, most studies kind of point towards about 30% of people with MS experiencing some form of depression. And to put that into context, uh, this is about two to five times higher than what you would find in a general population of people who don't experience uh, MS. Mm -hmm. another, another very common mood problem relates to anxiety. And this could include things like panic attacks. And this tends to affect about 20% of people with, with MS, which is about three times higher than what you would find in the general population. There are other forms of mood disorders that are also picked up, but these tend to be less common than uh, typically depression and, and anxiety. Mm. So depression and anxiety. Are there any sort of other more of the common emotions to experience or, or are those the two sort of the biggest ones? Well, they are the largest ones mm. that we find in the literature, but, it, but the way in which uh, people experience these mood problems can be quite varied. Mm. So some of the common emotions that people experience, even with a condition like depression, you know, which is typically characterized by experiences of feeling sad, a loss of interest in, in pleasurable daily activities. You could also find that depression affects people in very many different ways. Mm. So for instance, some people report uh, a loss in appetite, uh, they don't feel like eating anymore, or they experience sleep difficulties. Or, uh, interestingly enough, some people experience depression in terms of irritability, an increase in, in uh, feeling angry or irritable. Mm. But others can, can experience this in terms of an increase in fatigue or a feeling of worthlessness, of guilt, or losing interest in, in, in sexual activities, for example. Mm. And yet others experience this in a more kind of a cognitive way. For instance, they find it, uh, thinking and concentrating uh, a, a bit more challenging. And of course, you know, you have um, some people who also think about self-harm. So, you know, the, you find quite a range mm -hmm. of severity, but also a range in terms of the the, the way in which some of these um, symptoms of depression manifest themselves. And if you think about anxiety, which I mentioned is another one of those kind of large group of, of signs and symptoms, you know, typically what would happen is that people may experience certain bodily sensations. So people tell us that they experience an increase in their heart rate. You find that, you know, um, they experience dryness of their mouth, shortness of breath. Some people experience some nausea, feeling like they want to throw up. Mm. Um, tingling of their fingers and toes, lightheadedness, all these kind of things, sometimes even restlessness or insomnia, these can be some of the bodily sensations associated with anxiety. So sometimes you may experience these bodily sensations and you're not entirely sure what it is you're experiencing, but sometimes they could be more psychologically based. You know, So for instance, people with anxiety typically report constant free or frequent feelings of worry, feeling out of control, indecisiveness. Mm. Um, but also, you know, sometimes people engage in slightly repetitive behaviors or what we call ruminatory thoughts. So, you know, you get a thought into your head 
and you keep thinking about it over and over again and you can't seem to get it out of your head uh, and you know you may have some negative thoughts about the future so all these kind of things are some of the psychological ways in which people experience anxiety now one thing to mention over here is I may have repeated myself when I was talking about depression and when I was talking about anxiety and that's uh, that's not a coincidence not not by chance because anxiety and depression often tend to happen simultaneously you know mm. so so most people with some degree of depression or low mood would also experience some degree of of anxiety but typically you know a lot of people with ms also experience what are called adjustment disorders so we conducted a review a few years ago looking at various studies of uh, with people with MS. In fact, I think there were over 130,000 people with MS from different parts of the world who took part in, in various um, studies. So we synthesized all this information to try and understand um, what are the factors that are related to people's ability to adjust to their MS. And we found largely two types of factors, one related to yourself uh, or internally, and one related to other people or kind of external factors. So internal factors related to things like our emotional response to uh, a healthcare condition. So for example, you know, do we have negative thoughts consistently or do we have high levels of anxiety versus, you know, someone who is a bit more optimistic or hopeful for their future. So, you know, how people respond emotionally can have an impact in terms of your future ability to adjust to a condition like MS. We also have kind of potential personal attributes. Um, in fact, just, you know, we, I was talking to your colleague uh, about, you know, this idea about optimism and, you know, mm -hmm. how important optimism is. And we find that, you know, people who are generally more optimistic about life um, tend to have better ability to adjust to new circumstances like MS uh, or new symptoms. You know, we also have uh, found that people's uh, attitudes towards their MS and the MS management also has an impact in terms of how they're able to adjust. We find those who can incorporate MS as a part of who they are, a part of your identity, uh, are, are better able to adjust than those who try to, to kind of not regard MS as having anything to do with them, although it's affecting them. So those are some of the ways in which we think internal ways of uh, adjusting uh, or, or, you know, enable people to to deal with their MS differently. But as I mentioned, other people can also have an impact in terms of your ability to adjust. So for instance, mm -hmm. the support and the quality of the relationships you have with others has a definite bearing in terms of how you're able to adjust. And this can also do deal with um, the professional support that you get, not just in terms of related to your healthcare, you know, healthcare support, but also the kind of support that you might get um, at work, for instance. And it's also important to, I suppose, remember that, you know, it's not just the person with MS, but sometimes it's the loved one or your family mm -hmm. members who could be affected uh, by, uh, by, by, you know, some of these changes that are happening with the person with MS. So it's important to look after, to, for them to, for family members to look after their own psychological well-being also. Mm. And we often talk about people being affected by MS, but that's not mm. always just the person with MS, but it's, mm. like you say, the whole, whole surrounding. Um, on, on that note, so if if people are starting to feel that it's a bit much to handle, what, what's the best what's the best approach here? What, what should we do? Well, I think there's a multi-stage approach. I don't think there's a, you know, a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. kind of an approach or, you know, there are various things you can do. But I think this, the starting point for me would be to monitor how you're doing. And, and and by this, I'm not talking about anything terribly complex. I'm just talking about, you know, checking in with yourself, you know, how am I feeling, you know, or if you are feeling a bit jittery, if you're feeling a bit unsettled, ask yourself, 
what what's causing me to feel unsettled now so the reason i'm suggesting this is because you can then potentially act on something before it gets worse and before you start feeling like it's all a bit too much for me to handle so that's the first thing i would suggest you know think about how am i doing checking in with yourself the second thing i'd like to mention is you know avoid avoidance uh, what i mean by this is that uh, typically, when we get stressed or when we get upset, I think we have a natural tendency to avoid dealing with it. You know, in some cases, that's fine. What's worrying us might go away, you know, might disappear. But if you don't think it's going to go away or you don't think it's going to disappear, not dealing with it is possibly going to make things worse in the long run. So it might be a good idea to come up with a plan on how you're going to address these issues. And that brings me to my third point, which is talking to someone you trust. Uh, you know, the old adage, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. Mm. And, you know, there was an interesting study that Age UK did, which showed that when people share their worries with others, it really does improve their situation. So like over a third of people felt brighter as a result of sharing their problems. So, you know, there is something about sharing the problems, but, but, but you know, this is with somebody you trust and you have a relationship with. And sometimes it's also helpful to talk to somebody, you know, outside your immediate circle of friends and, you know, or your family. So speak to somebody at um, an MS charity, like the MS Trust, for example, or the MS Society or other charities, uh, or a trained volunteer. You know, as people with MS um, learn to adjust to live with the disease and, you know, their mental and uh, mental well-being also improves over time as their adjustment improves. So, you know, if you're newly diagnosed, there may be others who've been where you've been, who've gone through some of the struggles that you're going through and have come up with sometimes really great innovative ways of dealing with some of these challenges. So speaking to them might be one way in which you know you could try and get some suggestions or tips from them and ultimately you know if you're really struggling you ought to really consider speaking to a healthcare professional because they can they can definitely do things to help you mm. and i think you know we certainly see on on um, both on social media but i think in, in our facebook group that we the ms trust mm. have that uh, people do it's that kind of recognition of people understanding what you're going through and it really helps kind of open up that door of, of talking about it because not not or sometimes your surrounding don't really understand what you're going through so it's just that kind of niceness of meeting other people that, that even if they don't have the same symptom or 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 like the same level of ms it's still like that kind of recognition absolutely and i think it's 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 really important to do that because you know uh, i think i think i think one of your first questions helena was you, you asked me was you know how does ms affect your mental health but I, I also think it's so important to think about your own mental health because we can kind of turn that question on its head a bit and say well how's your mental health going to affect your ms mm. because there is this kind of bi-directional uh, uh thing happening over here because not only ms affecting your mental health but how you feel and you know your psychological health can also uh, make your ms worse in some respect you know if, if you're not dealing with say stresses so for instance um you know if um you've got low mood we know that people with low mood as i mentioned tend to avoid doing say activities that they enjoy mm. doing or they once enjoyed doing they stop going out they stop socializing and as a consequence of that you know we know that people um, have lower opportunities for mental and physical stimulation and that can make for example your cognitive functions you know your thinking your 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 ability to problem solve your ability to concentrate it can actually make those cognitive uh, functions a lot worse. So there is this kind of bi-directional aspect of mental health and MS, which is another reason why it's important for us to talk about mental health and to deal with our mental health. I think it was really interesting the way you turned it on the head there, because I, especially when you, you mentioned before about sleep or, you know, when you get a, a thought in your head and you can't get let, let go of it, if you're awake during the night, if you don't get sleep, we all know that your MS symptoms tend to get worse as well. Yeah. So it's it's kind of 
it's um, it's a bit of a joined circle there, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so people has told us that changes in their cognitive abilities have significantly affected their emotional health. You mentioned a little bit about uh, cognition. Uh, uh, do you recognize this from your own sort of clinical experience? Oh yeah, absolutely. Both from my clinical experience, but 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 also from uh, a lot of the research that others and we ourselves have done. Because how we think and how we feel are very very closely connected. So um, let me give you an example from some work that we've been doing recently in the UK. Um, you know, we've been rolling out um, cognitive screening in some um, NHS trusts uh, in MS clinics. And what we've done is we've assessed people's mood and we've assessed people's cognitive abilities, you know, people's memory, problem solving, attention, concentration skills. And what we find is that they're highly related. So those with who report higher levels of mood problems also report higher levels of cognitive problems. And these are not just on subjective, you know, uh, people reported uh, measures, but also on what we call objective measures, you know, some of these kind of brain training or brain exercises or puzzles that, you know, if you've been to a neuropsychologist, your neuropsychologist might do some of these tests with you. So even on some of those tests, which are, which are seen to be objective in some ways, we see an impact on, on those kind of tests if people are reporting higher levels of mood problems. But what's also really interesting is when we've done studies of, say, for example, cognitive rehabilitation, where the predominant focus of our rehabilitation is to enable people to deal with their cognitive problems a little better, to improve, you know, their ability to remember to do things in the future, you know, to remember to pick up their kids from school or to support people in, in work. Although the focus of our efforts has been purely on cognition, when we look at outcomes, we find that actually people report that it's not just their cognition that's improved, but also their mood that's improved. So, you know, whether we look at it from an assessment perspective or from a treatment perspective, dealing with one relates to the other. So they are very closely intertwined. Mm, they go hand in hand, it definitely sounds like. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we spoke a little bit about reaching out mm. and talking to people, but if you go down the route of going to talk to your, um, your GP or, or, you know, going to actually uh, sort of a, uh, away from just talking to family and friends. What mm. treatment options are there out there? Uh, there are, there is now really a wealth of research uh, evidence suggesting that there are very effective uh, psychological and medical treatments. Um, I'm a psychologist, so I'll stick to talking about psychological treatments. Um, but, but two things to mention, really. There are I think we need to focus not just in terms of treatment, but we also need to think a bit about prevention mm. because, you know, that that's, that's, that again goes hand in hand in some yeah. respects. And it, it's really important to, for us to, all of us to look after our own mental health, you know, so for example, finding out what causes stress or worry or upset in daily life and and finding ways to to minimize this so for example if you're stressed at work you know perhaps carefully considering whether disclosing your ms status to your managers um, might be useful because they may be able to make reasonable adjustments to your work uh, which might then in turn reduce your stress mm. the other thing we can do in terms of prevention is this idea about resilience building so you know we've got research that has shown that maintaining good social connectedness and social support is 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 really important um you know and some of this uh, you know as we've mentioned can come from your family and friends but mm -hmm. you know you may also want to join some ms groups so organized by ms charities and see what 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 whether the and another thing is you know it's really interesting that you could also look at what kind of support you can offer them, you can offer others, you know, with, with MS, uh, like, for example, some of these volunteer groups, you know, because we find that helping others is really a, 
is, is a great way of helping yourself in a sense because it helps sometimes in sharing uh, not just your own experiences but you know your your own initiatives that have helped you with others and and you know vice versa they may come up with some suggestions from from this for, you know that they found helpful but but talking about treatment it's it's important to to mention a couple of things one is that not everybody benefits from all treatments you know so um you know when i talk about effectiveness of treatments i'm referring really to on average how does a treatment uh, affect most people with ms and the second thing to mention is that different types of treatments appeal to different types of people so there isn't one type of psychological therapy you know there are different types of psychological therapies so if you've tried one and it and you feel well this is not for me yeah, please don't give up there are different types of psychological therapies and you know i know for a fact that i myself you know, will not do well with some types of psychological therapies, but will do better with other psychological therapies. And then the other thing to consider is that sometimes therapies are offered in groups and sometimes they're offered as individual sessions and sometimes, you know, a combination of these. So, you know, uh, figure out what feels right for you. But responding to your question uh, specifically, Helen, about the treatment options, the psychological treatment options. Um, as I mentioned, there are several types of psychological therapies, but I'll just stick to two or three, which have the most amount of research evidence that uh, for people with MS. The first one, I, I suspect lots of people have heard about it because, you know, we've been hearing a lot about it in the media, is about cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Now, CBT typically involves teaching people uh, uh, living with MS uh, techniques about self-monitoring of, of, their, of their mental state, the daily stresses that they're experiencing, le learning to restructure the way in which we think about things, think about our stress and think about our lives, and also teaching people problem-solving strategies. And research has showed us time and again that it's effective in reducing stress, uh, it's, it's, it's effective in reducing depression and anxiety symptoms, and also improving quality of life. And there's also some studies, some studies that have shown that it has a knock-on effect on people's MS symptoms also. Um, what's interesting is that people, it's not just people with MS that have shown to be uh, benefiting from CBT. In, in one review study that we did looking at various healthcare conditions, we found overall CBT is beneficial in a, in a whole host of different conditions. The second treatment option that uh, I think has got a good evidence base is what we call behavioral activation. Now, this is basically a, a, a therapy which, which tries to help you to identify and engage in activities that are meaningful for you as an individual that you may have engaged in before, but you know, over time, because of various MS symptoms, perhaps you've stopped engaging in, and, and as a consequence, you've withdrawn from those activities. We find that it's really effective in various conditions, including MS, and we did a small study with people with secondary progressive MS using this particular type of therapy, and we found that uh, for some participants, you know, it increased, engaging in this kind of therapy increased their activity level, but we also saw that it reduced depression. And finally, the, the, the last type of therapy I want to talk to you about is about mindfulness-based uh, treatments. Again, something that some of you may have uh, read about in, in, in the newspapers or, or heard about more recently. And these could be uh, a whole host of different types of therapies, some of them psychological therapies, but also relaxation therapies, yoga, meditation, music therapies. So one review that we did looking at the effectiveness of some of these types of mindfulness therapies, which included over 1,000 people with MS, found improvements to distress, to improving low levels of mood. So people with low mood showed an improvement of mood. It improved people's quality of life. And in some cases, some MS symptoms like fatigue and pain. So 
there, there are a whole host of therapies out there now which which with with some really good evidence showing that they're beneficial to people with ms i think it's interesting because we was, we all get different emotions and clearly there's different techniques for different people and i like that because it's not like one size fits all so mm. you can try one and if if it's not working for you there is other things to try isn't there absolutely yeah yeah um so my final question to you before we move over to our next guest would be so if what would your advice be to someone with ms or maybe if it's some someone who has somebody with them as in their family, you know, somebody struggling with their feelings and mental health, what, what would sort of be your one takeaway thing? You've already given so many <laughs> interesting things, but if there was one thing that you would say, do this today. Oh gosh, that's, that's really hard to kind of whittle <laughs> down to, uh, to one thing, but um, uh, I think there, if if I if I may, there are a couple. You, of you may say more than one thing. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things, or a few things that you could really, you could really try and do. And as I said, you know, like try and understand what's causing the stress. You know, is there anything you could do to address it? You know, if there is something that's bothering you, speak to somebody. Try and keep yourself active. You know, there's a whole wealth of uh, uh, evidence that shows exercise is really really beneficial and even if you can't do strenuous exercises because of some of the symptoms you're experiencing just trying to keep yourself active is is really uh is really important particularly active in doing things that are that you feel are rewarding to yourself you know because th that can help you with with your mood problems and and i think the key thing to remember over here is that mood problems are common amongst people with MS. There, there, there are now, uh, as I mentioned, a whole, uh, ar a whole array of medical and psychological treatments that are available that have been shown to be effective in treating these conditions. So, so please don't ignore these mood problems uh, because there are things that you can do for yourself in dealing with some of these problems, or there are things that others can can help you with, and uh, and help is out there. So please talk to people. That's that's my parting message, I suppose. That was fantastic. <laughs> that, brilliant. Thank you so much. That is a very insightful overview about the ins and outs of MS and feelings and, and some good kind of practical things to think about. And just before we move on to our next speaker, just a note about uh, questions. So if you have any questions for either Roshan or Cora, or even to the MS Trust, I can see that people have already been popping things in the, in, in the chats. Um, and we'll Towards the end, we'll take some of these questions and we will uh, ask them uh, to uh, put them to our guests. And, and as uh, Roshan mentioned, um, we're not going to be, be able to answer any questions about sort of medica medication suggestions or anything like that uh, in this stream. So if you have those type of questions, could, we could suggest you reaching out to your GP or, or MS team or even uh, contact the inquiry line. Um, and you mentioned, Roshan, about um, talking about uh, sort of how how your feelings can impact other people or or sharing and i feel like you know this is one thing that we really wanted to to ha make happen with with these films uh, that we've been putting out on social media with the hashtag of uh, ms makes me so just before we chat to to cora we'll just uh, watch another film from our campaign of hashtag ms makes me ms makes me feel grateful MS makes me anxious. MS makes me scared. MS makes me disorientated. My MS makes me feel grateful. MS makes me feel anxious. MS makes me tired. MS makes me feel judged. MS makes me frustrated. MS makes me thankful. MS makes me grateful. My MS makes me feel annoyed. MS makes me question. MS makes me feel overwhelmed. MS makes me determined. MS makes me feel clueless. MS makes me feel challenged. Not so great. 
lots of great videos there. Um, if you want to get involved with this uh, campaign, you do make your own videos and pop them up on on, on social media, and you know, uh, tag us or any of the other charity partners, and uh, do the hashtag of uh, MS Makes Me, um, and we'll try and you know retweet them and put them out. Or you can even send them to us, and we can incorporate them in some of these videos that we put out as well. Right, uh, next up, uh, Dr. Cora Sargent, an educational psychologist and person living with MS. And now Cora runs a very interesting podcast uh, about MS. I don't know if I'm actually be able to properly say what it's called because it's sciencing the beep out of MS, <laughs> where she takes a, takes a specific science of psychology and tries to apply that to living with MS. I think I've described that. Okay, got it. <laughs> and it's a really interesting approach. I think I've been listening to it um, uh, in preparation for 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 for, to, for today, and I find it really really interesting. And Cora also recently shared a personal story on our website, so we're very excited to have you here, Cora. Welcome. Uh, uh, my great pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. And <laughs> um, so, before we start talking about emotions and feelings, could you just give us a, like a little short story about yourself and your MS diagnosis? Yeah, for sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Cora. Um, I'm an educational psychologist by trade, but I work at the University of Southampton as a senior teaching fellow um, on the doctorate in educational psychology. So I teach other people how to become educational psychologists, which is a great honor. They're absolutely amazing. Anything that I do that's good in my <laughs> in my career is almost entirely due to some outstanding trainees I get to work with and colleagues. But I was diagnosed like four years ago-ish, and uh, it was a strange little journey. I was working half-time as an EP out in schools, supporting children, young people with special educational needs and disabilities to be included in school, That's sort of what we do. Um, and I was working half-time at the University of Southampton, and neither half-time job were really half-time jobs, as I'm sure anybody with a part-time job can attest to. And I was working hard and doing all kinds of stuff and loving it. I thought it was, uh, I was having a great time. Mm. And then one day I realized that I was numb in one leg. Um, and it was a bit weird, it sort of spread up my leg. And I was like, this is an unusual experience. Um, and when I told my neurologist this, uh, he wrote back to my GP and he wrote back to me this story. Uh, and he said, Cora discovered that she had gone numb in one leg in the shower. She had not shaved her legs in some time. And it was when shaving her leg that she discovered. And I was like, that's absolutely true. Uh, totally true and totally unnecessary. Uh, wonderful. He's right. Uh, it's exactly how I discovered it. Um, and it went away after like six, seven weeks. And then I lost a sense of taste. Uh, which was very strange, sort of came on fairly suddenly. And then it went away after seven weeks or so. And I was like, this is weird. I went to go see my GP and he was like, I think you're just anxious. And he was absolutely right. Uh, I'm an anxious person, particularly about health concerns. Uh, but still, uh, I went to go and get a second opinion from another GP at the, at the practice. Everyone was, you know, characteristically kind and generous. But this second GP was like, huh. Okay, we're going to send you to a neurologist just in case. And the neurologist gave me an MRI just in case. And then uh, I got a letter from uh, from the MRI team that just basically said a single lesion on the left lateral ventricle, likely inflammatory in origin. And I was like, damn, <laughs> I, I knew enough to know this was trouble. Um, yeah. And then I went in and and. It gave me another MRI of my spine and I've yeah, got a few spinal lesions um, and that was it. Got diagnosed and uh, nothing has ever been the same since, I would say. Um, it has been a bit of a journey. And, and I think it's, you know, for me, has been a mental health journey as mm -hmm. much as a physical one. You know, I've, I've had a, a bunch of weird symptoms as part of MS. I have relapsing remitting MS and my remissions remain pretty strong for the time being. But uh, the uncertainty of the disease presents a context in which mental health is hard to maintain, I think. You know, life is a challenging context in which to maintain mental health, but you know, MS creates a really unusual context. So I, you know, I didn't know how to manage it. I really didn't. 
And so I, the only thing I know how to do in this world, I'm not very good at many things. One thing I am good at is understanding the scientific literature of psychology. Like asking scientific questions and getting answers is what I do. So I asked the question, how do you thrive with MS? And there is a whole world of research out there. You know, Roshan, and what a beautiful opportunity to meet somebody who's engaged in the research that I rely on to understand how to thrive with this condition. Um, and it turns out there's lots of things, lots of seeds that I can plant in the garden of my mental health. And, and that's what I've been trying to do. And actually, since I started doing that, the world has kind of opened up a bit to me, um, you know, cherishing and, and relishing in the relationships that I love that are important to me in a way that I didn't before, you know, cherishing the things that I find important and, you know, enjoying the challenges and overcoming the challenges that this disease presents as it sort of, you know, tries to put a barrier between me and the things that I want to do in life and keeping my eyes on the horizon, heading towards the things that are important to me. Um, yeah, I think, I, I I'd give it up in a in a second. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> MS <laughs> sucks. Uh, I'd I'd give it all back if I could. Uh, but given that I can't, um, you know, I'll do what I can to thrive in its context. Um, you mentioned um, sort of how you try to apply it because I, I love the fact that you sort of you look at the science and then you see right. Let's see how we can apply that to 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 life. So, so what are some of your strategies for managing MS symptoms? I think. I think the biggest thing that I have I have learned so far, there's this really interesting uh, intervention called Implementation Intention Interventions, which are a podcaster's kryptonite. Uh, I spent an entire 30 minutes on my podcast, like just stumbling over that phrase. But essentially, it just means that we think about what it is that you want to achieve. What is it you're aiming to do in this moment, like right now, whether it be like, you know, spending time with your partner, whether it be wanting to walk to the beach, whether it be, you know, trying to record a podcast, and then perceiving the barriers that the MS presents as challenges, and planning how to overcome them. So I, you know, for a while, for a long time, about a year, I was experiencing chronic pain with the disease, I had nerve pain. So anybody out there experiencing nerve pain, I feel your pain. It is uh, a huge challenge to overcome. Um, and I was waking up at night in pain and then not being able to get back to sleep. And I was like, I don't know, I just panic. You know, how do you manage that? And so I started to treat it as an experiment, right? It would consistently wake me up about the same kind of time every night. And so I started to kind of experiment with the things that may help or might make it worse and learn from that and build a plan for how I would manage. So for all the symptoms I experience now, I have a plan. My pain management plan was like, I, you know, if I stay in bed, I'm too warm, the pain doesn't go away, it makes it worse. So I learned to get up immediately. I'd sit on the couch here. I learned to kind of keep my body temperature as reasonable as I could. I learned to, to sit upright with my posture upright. I learned to watch Netflix, all of the wild, you know, those, the darker side of Netflix, the stuff that you don't tell your friends you've been watching on Netflix, you know, you're watching that <laughs> at three in the morning. And then like, I'd, I'd put my timer on my phone so I could look at it and know that's how long I had to sit in pain. Because with all of those things, I could bring the time that I was in the most severe pain down. And then I could time it and be like, I've got 27 minutes roughly to be in pain. And if I just start the timer and whenever I'm starting to panic, I look to the timer and I know it's just 15 more minutes and it will get a little better. Maybe it won't go away. Maybe it'll come back. But this round, it will go at that time. So that's how I manage every challenge that the MS presents. I build a plan. When I experience it, these are the things that I will do. And that has helped me a great deal because it just helps to know that I can do something right now. Whatever's getting in the way, this is what I'm gonna do. Pain management plan, walking management plan, fatigue management plan. I got plans for everything, I'm telling you. 
Yeah. I love that. I, I would love to read your plans. I think that would be very interesting to see. Um, we often say to people to do like a symptom diary, but this is almost taking it one step beyond that because it's not just having the diary, but actually doing a little bit of research almost on yourself there to see what how how you deal with different situations and, and how it goes. I really like treating it as a challenge because it feels like a threat so often. And when I perceive it as a threat, my my instinct is to run away and to avoid mm. it and to be afraid of it. Um, and when I see it as a challenge, there's a bit of me that just feels a little determined, you know, like experimenting with the different things, maybe this different thing today, it's gonna make it worse, but then I know something I didn't know yesterday. And then I can use it tomorrow to build the plan. And each day it gets, you know, gets more elaborate. It's, um, you know, we solve one problem, we solve the next problem, we solve the next. And if we solve enough problems, you know, we get to get to thrive. That's 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 my motivation. I like that. And um, so you spoke about the different management plans and things. What, what sort of approaches do you take if you're struggling with, with sort of the low mood and anxiety and depression, the things that Roshan was talking about that's so common within MS? Yeah. I recognize Roshan's description a lot. Yeah. Anxiety is my bedfellow for sure. Um, particularly with the MS, it just, there's so much to be afraid of. Right? There's so much to be concerned about what might happen. And so much uncertainty that it, you know, it's very difficult not to feel threatened by that. And I experienced a lot of anxiety over the summer and I did reach out to the MS Trust and found it enormously valuable. Thanks so much. Um, and I reached out to my GP and people and I reached out to friends. And, you know, I know my mum's in the audience. I can see her out there. Uh, and I, you know, in my worst moment, you know, I turned up on her, her doorstep in floods of tears and she just gave me the biggest hug, the best support out there. And my other half, my wife Kaz, in my darkest moments, you know, is my rock. We went to the beach last week and I can only walk for about 12, 13 minutes and it turns out the beach was 15 minutes away. So she she proper Samwise Gamgee'd me and was like, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. And she basically like dragged me to the beach the last couple of minutes. Absolute legends. So social support has been a huge, huge thing. The other end of that, I think is, I think Roshan mentioned it, the sort of temptation to avoid. Like I always thought of avoidance as something that you know, there's something instinctive and natural to, evade the things that were scary in our lives. And I never thought of it as something that was a real problem until I started you know, doing this research and reading. And I realized that experiential avoidance really genuinely is a challenge that we need to overcome. It's, it, I, I, there's a great TEDx talk. Uh, I can't remember the guy who talks, but uh, he's somebody who works with people with anxiety and experiences it himself. And he describes it as a, you know, as the anxiety like your ship's crew. And the more that you ignore what they're calling for, the more that you ignore their concerns, the louder they have to shout. And when they're shouting, you as captain can't be heard. You can't reassure them because they're shouting too loudly. And so his point becomes that actually we need to hear their anxieties you need to listen to the crew of your ship so that you can uh, you can then be heard because they will quieten the more you hear them. I, there's a great quote from Life of Pi. I'm a huge, like I'm becoming an avid reader these days. Um, and Life of Pi has this beautiful quote, which I have here if you would mind me uh, sharing it. I'm good for it. <laughs> I must say a word about fear, says Jan Martel. It is life's only true opponent. Only fear can defeat life. It is a clever, treacherous adversary, how well I know. It has no decency, respects no law or convention, shows no mercy. It goes to your weakest spot, which it finds with unnerving ease. It begins in your mind always, so you must fight hard to express it. You must fight hard to shine the light of words upon it, because if you don't, if your fear becomes a wordless darkness that you avoid, perhaps even manage to forget, 
you open yourself to further attacks of fear because you never truly fought the opponent who defeated you. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. I like that. <laughs> and I always thought this was like a you know, literary idea and I didn't take much stock in it because I'm a big scientist. But then I came across experiential avoidance and realized actually there's good evidence to suggest that what we need to do is accept the situation as is without judgment. You know, my anxiety management plan starts with radically accept and non-judgmentally notice what's going on internally and be curious about what the anxiety is trying to communicate. And the more I accept it, the more I listen to that part of myself, the quieter it becomes. And then the more I can be heard as I reassure myself that I'm safe, that I'm loved, that I'm me, it's gonna be all right. That's really, really good. Um, do you have any sort of particular stories from when you used psychology to help manage MS or, or other situations in life? Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, I I think the podcast has got to be like the story. I mean, I've used, I, I think most of the time, what I have done has been to try to find the funny in what I'm experiencing. That's the kind of thing that I've done most frequently. Um, I I find it hard. Like, so I'm, hi everyone, I'm transgender. Um, I, and I've talked about being trans in all kinds of places. And I, I have found the funny in being trans much more easily. Lots of wild experiences. But be, ha having MS is harder to find funny, mm. but it is possible. That's brilliant. I'm just aware of the time and I thought we, we might have to see if we can um, get some questions from people like is that are we okay to to answer some some questions absolutely we, otherwise in. we could just sit here and chat all day i think it's it's been very 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 interesting so um if we will bring oh here you are roshan and, and nick is on it <laughs> so um i think there's been a few questions that has popped up already um we got one here from uh Dot. Does MS impact your personality? I'm less empathetic. I now interrupt people uh, more and I offload to new people. Um, shall, I, shall I make an attempt? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about um, it affecting your personality per se. It really depends on how you define personality. For me, personality is something that is um, a very stable and ongoing way of responding to the uh, outside world and to the way in which you think about it. So to that extent, you know, um, I think, um, you know, in some respects, it's not just MS, but your life experiences mm -hmm. and and your 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 that have an impact in terms of how you begin to think about um, the world around you and how you respond to it. So if you find that you are getting um, a lot more, um, I can't remember the phrase you you used, but it was you know if you're getting more agitated about something, mm. if you're finding that you're offloading a little more. Perhaps it does have an impact in the way in which you are responding to the word world. Perhaps also because the world has been responding in a way that's been rewarding to you. So you know you found that there's something that's positively reinforcing or something rewarding for yourself. That would mean that there's a greater chance you're likely to do it again in the future. So to that extent, I think it it does have an impact. I think it's an interesting one because I I I know certainly so getting older myself I can feel like I I, I care less about um, my surroundings and I can sometimes sort of say things that I probably wouldn't have said when I was a bit younger because I know I just feel like so I don't know but a little bit with offloading doing this podcast sometimes when I'm chatting to people I share more than I set out to, yeah. to do in the first place because I'm just here to interview but then suddenly I'm talking about all my own MS symptoms. The, the, <laughs> the, the best type of interview. <laughs> just to add to that I think you know there may be some aspects of the personality that are a bit more uh, amenable or which are more likely to change than others just before the, the live stream started Corey and I were having a chat and we were talking about for example optimism if you're a kind of a, like half glass empty kind of person 
it's it's a, it's it's not very easy to ch to kind of flip that around or to change mm -hmm. that. So there may be some aspects of your personality that are a bit more resistant to change than other aspects. Yeah, Cora, have you changed noticed any sort of changes in personality yourself <laughs> since being diagnosed? I don't. I, I don't know. You know. I mean. Um, I think the things that I find important have changed. I think it probably is possible that it does happen to people, I'm sure. Um, mm. And I'm sure that, you know, when I'm most anxious, I'm definitely a very different person. Like I'm shorter with people and I'm, um, and I need more reassurance. And I, I'm sure, I'm sure that I, uh, uh, like I get a bit needy and clingy. <laughs> I think that's probably what I do. Uh, but, you know, um, I think, I think returning to the things that I find important are the things that kind of keep me like me, right? Mm -hmm. Because like when I turn to the relationships and realize that those are the important things to me and focus on those rather than focus on the things that the MS are causing problems with, then, then, you know, the MS just becomes a barrier to overcome to get back to those things. Yeah. There are moments now where I'm sat on the couch with Kaz and we're watching Succession. Succession's amazing, by the way. Uh, you know, watching, you know, and it's just, I just like take a beat to appreciate those moments because they're just gorgeous and fleeting. Oh, that's nice. Um, we're getting lots of questions about uh, your podcast, Cora. We're going to pop the links up. Um, and uh, we'll include them in the uh, in the email when it goes out with the, um, when we're sending this the links to to the to the podcast uh, very kind. out later because uh, people do need to listen it's a very 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 good one um i've got a question for roshan so i'm leaning over here a little bit um if you are seeking psychological support what is the best method ask for referral to your gp or existing ms team really good question um the answer to that is really depends on where you're based because uh, if you're based in the UK, um, the NHS is um, quite varied in terms of the kind of psychological support it can provide you, particularly in relation to MS. So I know that in some places, in some MS clinics within the NHS, you do have an in-house psychologist or neuropsychologist, but in some other places, you, you don't have that facility. So my suggestion would be, in the first instance, speak to your, your treating MS team. They may have uh, information about what's available in-house. So for example, if there is an in-house psychologist or a counselor or a neuropsychologist or a therapist, that might be a good uh, um, starting point. The, the other option is to contact your GP. I know that some GP practices do have some psychology input. Uh, the third option is really to look around. I know that in England, for example, there are um, there is the Improved Access to Psychological Therapy Service, which also allows self-referrals. So um, there are different ways in which you could go about doing this. My my feeling is if you start with the MS team, the or treating MS team, they usually have a sense of what's available locally, so you don't have to go very far to to access some of these services. So it's it's it really depends on where you're based, but starting with the MS team is a good bet. That's good. Um and I think, you know, it, it's, this has really changed over the years, hasn't it? Because it's getting so... I remember back when I was diagnosed in, I think it was 2007, um, I think I did inquire sort of about... It was very much just looking at the physical symptoms, but when I sort of yeah. said, I actually quite like to talk to someone about this diagnosis because it's really overwhelming me, and they were sort of just looking at, well, you have to pay for that, you know, private kind of... But it seems from what I've heard now that it's it's getting easier to to get sort of that access without having to... To pay for it yeah but uh th th that is true but mm. um you know given the the pressures we have on various yeah. nhs services there may be a waiting list in some areas longer than in other areas but what's really interesting is over the years there have been self-management uh programs 
that um, are beginning to demonstrate considerable levels of evidence of effectiveness. So what, what typically happens in some services is that while you're on a waiting list to see somebody to provide the actual therapy, they might start you off on a computerized program for CBT, for instance. Now, as I said, you know, these are things that can help some people. It's not for everybody. Some people will say, no, I don't want to have to do this myself. I really want to talk to another human being. That's fine, but you know, for other people, that might be something that they would find useful. So, as I said, you know, different types of therapies for different types of people. So, the, the, so while there are waiting lists on, in some areas more so than others, there are things that you can do yourself. And again, another good place to start with, would be with your GP, because some GP surgeries I know subscribe to some of these uh, programs. The, the difficulty is that there are so many. Uh, programs out there now, you know, the, the, the internet is awash with different things and not everything has been tested very rigorously, which is why it's a good idea to check with your GP whether there's something that they would recommend. Um, so, so that's a good starting point. I think Nick has said he wants to show a message from the chat for, for Cora. Um, it's uh, love your fun take on and various situations, Cora. It will be sure to take on that on board. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's we're in uh, this together, Linda. Jump on in here. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think it's it's very interesting to sort of listen to the different approaches. I, I saw there has been some questions about how to get started with mindfulness. I've seen both of you giving thumbs up on on, on mindfulness, and we did a stream on 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 Monday uh, with which was what, uh, about mindfulness, and we did a, a the guy there just he did a mindfulness session. Um, it's very much a buzzword at the moment, but how do you actually? get started and how can you apply it to 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 life with ms i mean i i, I there's a couple of ways that i've done it uh, there's a some great resources online around mindfulness there's also some wonderful sort of interventions that are fairly low cost actually and um, run by charitable organizations particularly in the uk um a quick search and you might find some in your local area and i've been on one very recently um i went on a mindfulness-based stress re reduction for ms course where all of the participants had multiple sclerosis and uh it was four weeks they you know, the the charity that i went with is an eight week one as well um and i'm sure there are others around the country but wow it was great uh it was good because apart from anything else like mindfulness is wonderful there's it's one of the best evidenced interventions that i've ever come across frankly um but getting the opportunity to meet and be with other people who knew what i was talking about and where you know somebody would say like oh, i'm having bladder issues or something and everyone else in the room is like for sure yeah welcome yeah like you know my bladder's like a small puppy if i get overexcited or if i get a little anxious then i'm i'm gonna pee on the floor like that's just that's just the way that it is and um, and and there's something beautiful about when people are in the room together working towards a common aim mm -hmm. and all really genuinely understanding each other that's kind of cool you know well that's a good idea to sort of try because sometimes i think people get maybe a little bit scared about trying it themselves because they don't know where to start so doing something like that when you're actually together with other people exploring it sounds like a good good approach yeah, it's a nice, there's some introductory sessions too. Uh, so you don't have to go on a full course. You can just go on one of these drop-in sessions perhaps. Um, uh, I found it very helpful personally. I do it last thing at night before bed, game changer, I'm telling you. Uh, absolutely wonderful getting me ready for sleep. This has been absolutely fantastic. I'm just aware of the time. We've been really going over time a bit. But like I said, we could probably sit here and chat all day. But uh, I just wanted to say if there were any sort of parting words of advice on, on sort of or final feelings about emotions and feelings for people with MS um, before we uh, are nearly at the end here. Cora? Uh, I think my main recommendation is to read The Martian by Andy Weir. Uh, anything by Andy Weir, I was list, I was reading, was I reading most recently, uh, Project Hail Mary, his most recent book, absolutely outstanding. Uh, but The Martian is a beautiful analogy for MS. 
It's about a guy who's stuck on Mars trying to grow a garden when, you know, the his habitation unit, everything around him risks breaking down and he's, you know, he's in real trouble. And there's a great quote from this book. He says, uh, at some point, everything's going to go south on you, everything. And you're going to say, this is it. This is how it ends. And he says, you can either accept that or you get to work. He says, you get to work. That's all it is. You just begin. You do the math. You solve one problem, you solve the next one and the next. And if you solve enough, if enough problems, you get to keep going. And there's something beautiful about like the focus on the problem at hand. You just focus on that one problem and then focus on the next. We keep working on it um, and, you know, treat each problem as it comes and move on to the next one. Uh, I think that's that's stunning. I really love that. Mm. And I love the book. It's so good. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I would encourage people to do. Just focus on the problem that's in front of you. Try not to see the ones down the line. That's a book for reading clubs then. I think I'm going to add that to my, uh, to my reading list. Uh, that's a hard act to follow, Roshan, have you? <laughs> well, definitely a hard act to follow. And I'm <laughs> certainly not going to share some of the, the, any recommendations of books that uh, particularly the ones I'm reading, because it's probably likely to make you more depressed um, <laughs> or worried than anything else. But I suppose my, my parting words would be, you know, that um, please don't suffer in silence. Uh, mental health problems particularly mood problems can and are invisible symptoms in a way and people may not always pick up the fact that you are struggling this includes people who are healthcare professionals uh, and because it's an invisible symptom it's really important for you to raise this with your treating team raise this with people you trust and people who are important with uh, important for you in your life because they may not be fully aware of what you're going through and they may be able to help you so uh, don't don't struggle in silence please speak up there is help at hand Fantastic. See, that it was a hard act to follow, but I think that was a brilliant end to this. <laughs> I want to say a huge big thank you to both of you. It's been so interesting, and I feel like I've learned a lot as well and things I'm going to try to apply to my, <laughs> my life. Um, and um, we will share links and things as well so, so people can get in touch. And, yeah, definitely go and listen to Cora's podcast because it's, it's brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier the ms trust has a wealth of information on all things ms related um and uh, including well-being and mental health uh, i think nick's going to pop up some resources uh, so i'll have to go quiet while that's on the screen um but we will also circulate them in a follow-up email on social media So don't worry if you didn't have time to note anything down, we'll share all these things. Uh, you'll also be able to watch this again on our YouTube channel uh, after MS Awareness Week. I believe you can go to the live tab and it should be updated there quite quickly. Uh, we'll put it out as a, as a proper big video in, a, in our um, uh, accounts as well and we will promote them on all our different social media and if you also signed up for the event via email you get an email reminder uh, when they're available uh, but you, yeah if you subscribe to a MS Trust YouTube channel then you won't miss it because then you get a notification um, and I think I think that sort of takes us to the end. Um, I just wanted to say a, a sort of a quick note on uh, donating to the MS Trust if you have found this useful. Um, we are a charity. Uh, we only rely on um, people's donations for, for uh, these things. We don't get any money from the, the government or from the NHS. Um, so I'm going to pop up a little uh, link here on how to donate if you would like to do so to support our work.
Brilliant. Um, now, I think we um, have got, um, I just wanted to say hello to everybody in the chat as well. I've sort of been ignoring you guys. Nick has been looking at you and chatting to you. You've been brilliant. I've seen some messages popping up. There's a lot of love for, for our guests, which is really, really nice. Uh, I feel, think both of them have been absolutely brilliant. Um, I just wanted to sort of end by saying that if we didn't get around to answering your questions, do you feel free to contact the MS Trust Inquiry Service? And it's available from Monday to Friday, except you, um, UK bank holidays. We've got a few of them coming up in, in May uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And outside these hours, you can leave us a message and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, the number is 0800 032 3839, or you can email ask at mstrust.org.uk. And once again, I want to say a big thank you to all our, to our speakers and everyone who's attended. And I hope that you found today's session useful. And I'll end with a screen for the inquiry service if you need them. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.